I'm Tony Swerves, attorney, minister, former legislator, and professor, and host of I Need to Know, a show dedicated to bringing you information on politics and law of Puerto Rico and the United States. Today, our guest is Manuel Ilelini, the president and chair of the Puerto Rican Bar Association of Puerto Rico. This is a product of the Public Trust Network. If you like what you hear, please check and subscribe. Thanks. Hi, I'm Tony Suarez, your host for I Need to Know Radio, and, and uh, this is our show f- uh, from the Puerto Rican Bar Association Conference. And today our guest is the president del Colegio de, Co- de Abogados Puerto Ricanos y Puerto Ricanos y Puerto Ricanas, ¿verdad? Eh, como en, en nombre en Puerto Rico, Manuel Quilichini. <laughs> y Manuel, otra vez, uh, por favor, uh, we're doing this in English, as I indicated to you, um, because our audience is up to the United States, everyone out there. We're trying to get everyone in the nation to understand what's going on in Puerto Rico. And and so um, that's what we're going to be doing in English and, and on our topics. Now, uh, but, but let's start off with first getting to know you. And let me please renounce, pronounce your name again for me, because as we indicated off the air, that your your actual name is is, uh, is of Corsican descent. And you, and you educated me to the fact that many uh, Corsicans left uh, uh, Spain and then, uh, well, left Corsica. But Puerto Ricans left Port Corsica and ended up in in, in, um, in Puerto Rico. So let's start off with the correct pronunciation of your name and if you could please give us you know, the position at, at Colegio. Right. Thank you very much for the invitation, Tony. Uh, my name is Manuel Quilichini. What makes it challenging is that when you read it, it if you read it in Spanish, it reads Quilichini. Q-U-I-L-I-C-H-I-N-I. But uh, uh, Corsica was part of Italy at one point in time. So it's Italian pronunciation. So the pr- correct pronunciation is Quilichini. But, we say, but we're not going to go into that and in correcting everybody. So I'm Manuel Quilichini. And I'm currently the uh, president of the Colegio de Abogados y Abogadas de Puerto Rico, known as the Puerto Rico Bar Association uh, in Puerto Rico. Now, uh, Manuel, the um, uh, let's talk a little bit about your practice. What do you do in Puerto Rico? Well, uh, I tell everybody I'm a reformed attorney uh, uh-huh. because I don't practice law. I haven't practiced law uh, actively in more than 10 years. I used to be a litigator uh, in all sorts of litigation in federal and local court. Uh, and 15 years ago, I was asked to take over uh, a not-for-profit corporation that provided health services to inmates uh, under the longest uh, court case in the United States, the Morales Feliciano case. That was a prison litigation, prison reform litigation. I started as a CEO uh, with the company, and I've been there since. At one point in time, being an attorney and going to court and being the CEO was incompatible. So I decided to leave the practice. However, I still teach uh, in uh, the uni- uh, in several law schools. I also uh, lecture quite a bit, and uh, and I and I help uh, friends, clients, old clients. Uh, so I'm not totally out of the practice of law, right. but uh, I do very little. I don't go to court. I don't litigate. I just do more uh, counseling and advice. Yeah, it's interesting that our histories are quite similar because I also have been reducing my practice to just part time, and uh, I dedicate myself most of my time to work with the non for profit law firm called the Puerto Rican Legal Services Clinic or the Legal Services Clinic of the Puerto Rican Community, and we've been I've been doing that since Hurricane Maria, um, and so I've dedicated more time to that aspect of of my <coughs> and and of course putting together this conference which is now going in two years and we'll discuss a little bit more about that l- later on but i find a lot of joy in working in this thing not being a litigated law because i too did a lot of litigation particularly litigation federal litigation so forth and criminal law 
and that's very only so I consider a young man's job, you know, go out there. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, after a while, you say, "Wait, I, I, gotta, I take it. I need to get a soft landing here for the rest of my. If I want to, I want to uh, uh, exist, you know." So it was very interesting, and that's what we're doing. What we're doing, apparently, you and I both, uh, in the love of the law, but in a, in a way that um, it expresses itself in in different ways. And so, let's talk a little bit about El Colegio. Obviously, this is the, the, uh, um, we have other Puerto Rican bar associates. We'll speak about that in a second. But let's talk about the. the the originator, the the, uh, the Puerto Rican el Colegio of Abogados. El Colegio was founded in 1840 by five, six attorneys, but their goal was not to create a guild or to deal with the attorneys. They they created the Colegio to help the un underserved and the poor. Puerto Rico in 1840 was very, very poor. There was very, there was no access to justice whatsoever. Uh, in those days, it wasn't known. But these guys decided to come together and create an association that would help those in need, the poor, the uh, the those that didn't have access to to uh, uh, attorneys or courts or even the press. So it started in 1840. That makes us the one of the oldest civil organizations in the Americas. It is the oldest in Puerto Rico, and it's one of the oldest bar associations in the Americas. Uh, we developed from there, you may recall, in 1898, we had the uh, Americans come in, the Spanish leave, so there was a lot of turmoil. Uh, and uh, the Colegio strengthened in the, 19, in the 1940s, into what it is now. It's the Bar Association. It was a mandatory bar. Uh, we had over 13,000 members. Uh, and due to political shenanigans, uh, the view that the bar was too far to the left and it was pro-independence, uh, a group of politicians uh, uh, decided to make the Puerto Rico Bar Association a voluntary bar. That happened in... in 2012, and uh, since then, we have been a voluntary bar. Uh, uh, not, we're not the only bar in Puerto Rico. There's the uh, the uh, Asociación de Abogados also, but we are the organized bar. We have a headquarters, and we provide a lot of services to our members, but we also provide a lot of services to the general population. We we do legal clinics. We we uh, educate, and we even participate in trials as uh, uh, friends of the court in in cases that will impact our citizenships, our, our member, our our society. So uh, that is basically our mission. Yeah, and that and that is what mimicking how the uh, the next bar, the New York Puerto Rican Bar Association, also grew out of the need for civil rights because back in the uh, 1950s when they started Puerto Rico Bar in New York. It was as a result of the need for have representation for the poor, uh, deal with uh, with uh, equal protection issues, um, and in the courts and so forth. And that's how that was born. And of course, now we have the Puerto Rican bar in Illinois, and we have a Puerto Rican bar in Florida. And so this this same mission has continued in order to co constantly uh, assist the community. And of course, the legal service clinic of the Puerto Rican bar association was born as a result of Hurricane Maria when we had nearly 50,000 Puerto Ricans migrate to Puerto Rico, to Florida, and we had to find a way of servicing them um, for all the legal needs, and the, the, it all came, they came with not just themselves, but they came with all the legal problems that came along associated with it. So um, it was born then, and we've been continuing to do, to do business. But one of the things that, uh, one of the aspects of the uh, legal services clinic is not beyond providing services to the poor. We also, I want to bring education. And one of the things that struck me always is being so much involved uh, because of Puerto Rico is, is a, uh, my heritage, although I was born and raised in, in New York, um, is the question of the political instability on the island due to partly of the, the question of its own controlling its sovereignty. So uh, while none of the bar associations, we do not take any position whatsoever what it should be, uh, that is for obviously for the people in, on the island to determine, but we do want to discuss with the rest of the country 
the the issue of Puerto Rico because Puerto Rico has is not able. Uh, if one hundred percent want to be a state, one hundred percent want to be uh, independent, it really doesn't make a difference because it's Congress who's going to make the determination as to what, what status Puerto Rico can and cannot have. Thus, the only way uh, to re resolve this is to have input from everybody around the nation in order to put pressure on their congressmen and the senators to have it. So without uh, uh, having a discussion on a national basis, you know, the, the ultimate issue on the island, they will never get an opportunity. And uh, it turns out on the front page of uh, El Asawan Star this day <laughs> comes that very issue. And perhaps we'll get to that uh, at, by the end of our, of our conversation. But certainly I believe that it's important to have the conversation. We lawyers, as as the pillars of 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 our system of our civil civil system have that obligation to to teach to inform and let the people make a decision based on information that is real and real happening so that that's the mission of the, of uh, of this coalition that we're putting together in order to inform educate and of course professional development uh, as well so tell me what is uh, about the Puerto Rico uh, colegio and Puerto Rico, what, what, what vision do you have for the bar uh, going forward? Look, we, we, as many other associations, professional associations, we are at a inflection point. Uh, I am a member of several organizations and we all have the same problem, membership. How do we convince the new generations to join our efforts? Uh, it has been uh, a, a challenge. And in Puerto Rico, it also has been a challenge. Again, we have 13,000 attorneys, but members of the bar currently, it's approximately 3,000. So to show our members value uh, of our services, it's been hard. Uh, on the other side, on the civil side, let's take, let's leave attorneys to one side. Uh, uh, we are in a, in a state of turmoil in Puerto Rico. Uh, People think that Maria devastated us and, and created all these problems, but no, it was Maria, earthquakes, the pandemic, and uh, our fiscal situation. Puerto Rico defaulted on all its loans, uh, and uh, we are under a bankruptcy proceeding that appears to be never ending. Uh, right now, we have a situation with our the... Uh, debt adjustment plan for the power authority which is incredible it is the it's a monopoly that went bankrupt if you can believe that uh but uh as of today we had a hearing yesterday on the issue and we're talking about a total debt of 8.5 billion dollars uh which which we cannot pay there is no way and puerto rico has the uh we the highest cost for energy for per electricity in all of the United States. We're paying around 27 cents per kilowatt. And that impacts our whole society because our economy is so dependent on electricity that uh, a, a one cent raise on the kilowatt has a uh, cascade effect on all prices. And, and then you add to that, uh, in Puerto Rico, it's always hot. It's always humid. Uh, Living here without air conditioner is, is a torture in, in many situations. And we have schools that have no air conditioner. Uh, and, and classes have to be suspended because of the heat index. Uh, and then we have the other challenges uh, typical of, of uh, any other uh, place. Uh, our population is not fully aware of its rights. And uh, they get trampled by the government. Uh, so uh, we have challenges, and the Colegio de Abogados has always been there to be the, to be the voice of those who do not have a voice, to be the voice of the destitute, not only the poor. Uh, just to give you an example, Tony, the uh, middle class is being squeezed yeah. out of existence because you get all the taxes, you get all the charges, but you don't get the tax breaks. So... Uh, it is very challenging, and the colegio is in the forefront of all discussions, not only of the status, but all of the discussions. Puerto Rican Bar Association of National Conference is a grouping of bar associations from around the country 
who wish to bring you information on the law and politics about Puerto Rico and in the United States. Seminars, workshops, and networking events for business persons and community activists who are interested in Puerto Rico and its community around the nation. Non-lawyers, tickets are free to the workshops. Networking and food events are a separate charge. For more information, see prbanationalconference.com. You can register online. Thank you. La clínica legal sirve para ayudar a la comunidad que no puede económicamente retener un abogado. Si usted cualifica, la clínica legal te pueda ayudar con consultas y representación legal gratis o por contribución mínima. Llama ahora 407-900-2065 en Florida. 407-900-2065, Florida. Yeah, it, it, uh, part of what you've hit on many, many topics, some of which we actually will be having workshops uh, during our conference here in September, which included the demographics of Puerto Rico. And as you indicated, it's not just the middle class, it's just the middle demographic age that are migrating out of Puerto Rico <clears throat> for the various reasons, uh, which we perhaps might be able to explore, but they're leaving and it's happening from what we can see from demographics. It's, it's getting older, just the older people there. You're not gonna have the young people, that, they're moving to the States, including many coming here to Florida. You're losing your doctors, they're all here in Florida, you know? And, and so it, it's, it's, a, it's a very critical situation, critical time for Puerto Rico, and, and um, so that's among the things that we're trying to address. And uh, go ahead. On the Democrat, on the demographics, we had a co the Colegio de Abogados sponsored a uh, demographic congress mm -hmm. to discuss what was going on, and the numbers are terrible. First of all, we are the jurisdiction with the highest growth in old age individuals of all the United States, and one of the highest in the world. Even the Florida. Uh, <laughs> Higher than Florida because in Puerto Rico, Rico, Florida is the waiting room, God's waiting room, you know. Well, guess this, you know, look, look at this. We have a higher rate of mortality than of birth. For the first time, we are not being substituted. We, people are dying and there's not enough birth. Young people, the young generations do not want to have children. And then you have the immigration people here. Uh, looking for better uh, conditions, leave. And who stays? The older guys, the us, uh, because I have to admit I'm in that category. Uh, and uh, the problem is your tax base is eroded. You don't have enough people to service. Right now, we're dealing with a crisis that our elderly homes have no help, financial help. They're going bankrupt. We had three races on our... Uh, a minimum salary, and and that has uh, had a negative impact, but the prices are rising, and now if you're middle class and you want to go to an elderly home, you cannot afford it. So uh, it, this is something that's slowly happening, but we see the train coming, and we're trying to get out of the way, but there is no policy to, to prevent that train from running us over. Yeah. Uh, and this is what is so critical for what we're all trying to do, convey information, because Puerto Rico needs <clears throat> some assistance. Um, and one of the things that, uh, that Puerto Rico has by the, its relationship, which is uh, difficult for most people to understand, we're now sending a team to the Olympics. So I got a lot of friends tell me, oh, I didn't know Puerto Rico is a country. <laughs> and then you have to tell them, well, they're not a country. They're not a state either. They can't vote. They get... So all this confusion and the problem is ultimately funding from, from several sources, including federal funding, is limited to Puerto Rico precisely because it is not a state. Um, and so the concept is that, you know, uh, uh, they don't get the same funding for highways, for schools, for Medicaid, Medicare, or all those things, which affects the, uh, the overall economy of, of Puerto Rico. Uh, and then there's something called the Jones Act. If you could give us a little background on that, uh, I'm sure you're familiar with this and, and how that affects Puerto Rico's economy. Okay. For starters, I want to clear up on the, on the federal aid. Puerto Rico, we are in Puerto Rico, U.S. citizens. We have 3.2 million American citizens living in Puerto Rico. 
Uh, however, we do not enjoy the same benefits as any other U.S. citizen because Puerto Rico is a territory. That means there's no full parity. What you get in social services and social aid in the United States, we don't get that. In, in, in the reason for that is we don't pay federal taxes. And if we don't pay in, it's harder to get money out. We, we get help, but it's, it's uh, in a smaller proportion. Now, the Jones Act, Puerto Rico is an island. Everything comes by sea, most things, because we have a few things coming by air. Uh, the Jones Act was created to protect the merchant marine of the United States. The merchant marine is necessary because if all the uh, the uh, boats coming into the United States were from foreign flags, they could uh, put a chokehold on any goods coming into the United States. So you have the merchant marine that uh, from the United States that can bring in goods. But in order to keep it operating, they did something very strange with Puerto Rico. All goods coming in to Puerto Rico have to come in in a boat that has that flies the American flag. Those are the, the costlier operations. Uh, but it all, all products have to come in in American flag boats. That makes things quite more expensive. Uh, economists have said that it could be anywhere between 10% to 25% more expensive. But you have to understand, we live in a small island. We have a huge amount of products coming in, billions of dollars. And on top of that, you're, you're paying a hefty price. Uh, we have requested to be exempt. And, and the, perhaps the best example was Maria. During Maria, we, were, uh, uh, we had a problem with, with fuel. And there was a, a ship that left Texas with uh, diesel for us. The ship could not dock in Puerto Rico because it was not flying an American flag. And in able to, uh, to, to, make, to be able to dock and deliver its product, it needed approval by Congress. Mm. You know, and getting approval by Congress is, is not easy. We even petitioned that uh, the law be amended that in, situa in emergency situations, just like Maria, we could be exempt. We were given a three-day exemption of that law. That, that that doesn't do it. Uh, so yeah. right now, it is a major issue. It makes life costlier in Puerto Rico. And the biggest danger is in the case of an emergency, we cannot receive goods from other countries. They have to go to the States, be put on American ships, and then brought to Puerto Rico. So yeah, so your Toyota has to first go to Florida, get a boat on Jackson in Jacksonville, and yep. then come down to, to, um, to Puerto Rico. So already you're increasing the cost of that one product onto itself. And actually, as it turns out, Jacksonville's biggest client from which they send stuff to is to Puerto Rico. Yes. Uh, Jacksonville being Jacksonville, Florida. So this is the kind of stuff that needs some legislative action and uh, at least national legislative action, which is why I think the importance of having this coalition between all of us, lawyers in different states, and then eventually having friends and I would love to look for the day when Wisconsin joins us and plays like that so that we can have this national uh, national discussion. And of course, um, it, 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 as we indicated, because Puerto Rico is a territory and governed under territorial, it doesn't have the ability to change these laws. And because it's not a state, it doesn't have a voice in Congress can actually vote and move and make deals for Puerto Rico because it's not a state. And so the 14th Amendment that had to be determined by the United States Supreme Court, it doesn't apply equally to Puerto Rico because Puerto Rico is governed, according to the Supreme Court in the United States, by the territorial clause and everything else is, uh, is secondary by comparison. So this is the situation that we have uh, currently in, in uh, facing the island and the Puerto Ricans. And, and it's not just a Puerto Rican problem. Because we, whatever happens to Puerto Rico has an effect in the states, vis-a-vis -vis what happened with and um, with Maria. And so, there's since we're American citizens, we are free to go someplace else, and if, and um, that causes a problem, imbalances, the Fourteenth Amendment issues, a bunch of issues which we have now you know been been talking about. So, um, I'd like to address the. Um, the, the question of, uh, of the, your convention. I know that you'll have 
lawyers uh, coming up. So t talk to me a little bit about the convention coming up. Well, uh, we hold a yearly convention, uh, and this year it's going to be held at the uh, Winham Rio Mar Hotel from the 5th through the 7th of September. The, that's the weekend after Labor Day. Uh, normally, during that convention, we have CLEs, two days of CLEs. Then we have uh, our uh, association's events. Uh, we have our general assembly, and then we have, uh, which is divided in, in two parts, uh, the business side and then the ceremonial side. Last year, we had the participation of Sonia Sotomayor. This year, we'll have uh, Glorimar Marrero, who is a screenwriter and a director, and she uh, wrote and directed a, a, a film called La Pecera, a very, very powerful film that uh, uh, was even submitted for the Goya Award in Spain. The Goya Award is the equivalent of the Oscar, and it did very well. Uh, and uh, I saw the movie, and I, I known about the writer, and we decided to invite her to talk about law, evolution, and tradition, because we are in that crossroad where uh, our traditional form of practice is dying, is, is, is going away, and, and we are evolving into I don't know what, but uh, it, there needs to be a discussion. So we will have that, have her as a keynote, and then we will always end, as Puerto Ricans do, with a big party, which is uh, our dance at, uh, at the end of the Saturday. And that gives me the leeway, uh, the segue, segue into what we're doing here in Florida, and because uh, we too have uh, this op operation September 26th to the 28th, and <clears throat> you can go to our website underneath. You'll see all the stuff that we have planned. But it starts with a reception at City Hall with the mayor of Orlando uh, greeting us. The next day we'll have seminars, which include seminar on the status with Representative Soto, who's already committed, and Representative Salazar, who's giving, sending in representative. Uh, these are both con congressional individuals, Republicans and Democrats. Uh, we then have classes on, some, on the demographics of Puerto Rico. We have professors, Puerto Rican professors from all of the different universities here in Central Florida, uh, South Florida, and uh, even New York that will be discussed their topics of, uh, of, uh, in, uh, of interest and so there's a, a lot of things going on, and we are making it free for all non-lawyers. You're, you're a non-lawyer, you, you want to take classes, come. And we're, we're inviting that. We have a partnership with the local Spanish newspaper. We're printing tickets to the public so they can come and listen to these experts, um, which leads me to one of the experts being you, who's <laughs> and, and talking about cybersecurity. Um, and I have trouble turning on my telephone these days, you know, it gets so complicated. And I, I and as a, title, <coughs> as a lawyer who did a lot of title work, you know, the, 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 the I have hackers all the time trying to get into into my my trust account. Um, and this is a high uh, question, you know, it's a difficult question for all of us because we have confidentially asked questions with clients. But it certainly is serious. If someone hijacked my trust account, I'm going to pay for it, not the, not the client. So, uh, so um, talk to us a little bit because I think that the United States Constitution is not quite ready, or at least <laughs> the way it's being interpreted, ready to the issue of privacy. And privacy is a major issue in, in the nation, and, and this cybersecurity thing deals with that, that portion of it. You know, it's uh it's interesting uh i teach high school children uh students about privacy uh and the law and uh in puerto rico we have our own constitution but it differs significantly from the united states in the united states you don't have a true right to privacy uh and it's only uh the way it has been interpreted is uh the government cannot mess with me however in puerto rico we have a right to privacy that uh, I can uh, use it against any individual who tries to intrude in my privacy. Uh, so, uh, but we all, as attorneys, we have to remember that we have a duty to preserve the confidences from our clients. And uh, something as simple as giving your phone to another person who's not an attorney 
could constitute a violation of the attorney client privilege. Why? Because right now our phones are our main tool of communication. We get emails from our clients, we get texts from our clients, uh, and all of a sudden you're giving your phone to a non-attorney so he can use it, but that means that he can read what's in the in, in the phone. That is a breach of the duty of confidentiality. Uh, and the problem with technology, it has created so many holes through which information can escape. And the attorney is always responsible for that. Uh, and, and, and now it's going to get even harder because the use of artificial intelligence is going to make hacking us easier. Uh, so what I, what I try to do in my classes and my conferences is create an awareness of where the vulnerabilities are. But the funny thing is, Tony, attorneys are a main target of hackers. Let's say you, you, you are General Electric and I'm your attorney. If I want to hack into General Electric, they have all sorts of security. Very hard to get in. Ah, but if I go to his attorney who might, might not be as well versed in technology, I may hack into his system and from there gather uh, a privileged information that I can use against the company. So uh, uh, it, it's becoming a challenge for us attorneys to recognize that we are the target of many uh, hacks, of many attempts to gather information, and that we have a duty to learn how to protect against that. Uh, because as you said, at the end of the day, we pay the consequence either through money or our title. And, uh, you know, interesting, I mean, as a trial lawyer, um, you think about how it exhibits. And now at this point, you cannot take at face value anything uh, as evidence. Do I now want to have a, a forensic uh, investigator to determine whether or not this is an IA? You know, they took a picture of me. They put my face in someplace else in somebody else's body, making confession, taking drugs or whatever. I mean, I don't know. It doesn't seem to me that it's going to be very easy to, to, to qualify evidence correctly. In the old days... Seeing was believing. Nowadays, don't believe what you see because the photograph is just the tip of the iceberg. My biggest concern is the use of artificial intelligence and deep fakes to create videos. All of a sudden, you're looking at a scene, somebody killing somebody else. We, we believe what we see. That's, that's human nature, but that's false. It's so easy to create a deep fake. And the problem is, to me, our rules of evidence have not kept up with the technology. Yeah. Uh, I teach evidence and I, I teach electronic evidence to the judges. And I tell them, don't take anything you see at face value. You have to ask. And nowadays, I want to see, see, I want to have sitting at the witness chair, whoever took that video, I want to do a full voir dire a full cross because I'm not going to believe anything I see. And it is a challenge that's going to keep increasing as technology perfects the ability to create fake images. Yeah. Our ability to identify them goes down. Right. It, 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 it's a whole area of law that I think that even if you're a non-lawyer, you'll be interested in coming. So please, you know, if you're in Florida or you're coming through it and you want to come to Manuel's uh, class, uh, he will be giving a, a, a talk about cybersecurity and uh, and we can discuss it among lawyers and among people to understand what's happening as we change uh, and change in law. Oh, we have so much that I have. I have to end this quote with this question. Today, I was looking at the Sun One Star. I saw the front page. And um, the front page dealt with a, a popular Democratic Party a, a law, a lawmaker saying to the future of the Republican, Republican or PNP, you know, uh, popular, and Nuevo Progresivo Party, uh, Jennifer Gonzalez, uh, that, that the, the, the Republican parties have dropped the statehood issue in Puerto Rico, uh, for statehood for Puerto Rico, which they've had it for 50 years on their platform. And now that is dead. So the, in, do you think that that is a, a correct statement? Uh, can I grab you into that? <laughs> unfortunately, <laughs> unfortunately, it is. 
and, and that brings us back to uh, our status and how we deal with it. Uh, historically, we many presidents uh, uh, agreed that the Puerto Rico situation had to be dealt with. The problem is that this has to be dealt with by Congress. And this is the fear, uh, which is stupid. If you if you look at Florida, you'll, you'll understand. Traditionally, Puerto Rico has been seen as a pro-Democrat jurisdiction because we're liberals and whatnot. The truth of the matter is that we are Latinos, and Latinos tend to be more conservative and share some values with the Republican Party. But this is how it goes. The Republicans say, I'm not going to admit Puerto Rico into the union because they would have anywhere between eight and 12 representatives and they would uh, impact the balance in Congress between Democrats and Republicans. Uh, that's one point. But I think that there's also, in, in a sense, some discrimination against Latinos. I think that the United States is not ready yet to uh, embrace a Latino state, uh, despite the fact that we are the biggest growing minority in the United States. Uh, uh, but we have become a uh, victim of national politics between Republicans and Democrats. And nowadays, the Republicans don't have statehood in their platform. But by the way, Democrats may have it, but they really are not interested in moving it. Right. It's a hot potato. It's something you talk about, but you don't come near it because there is no easy solution. And, and to that, you add that the Puerto Ricans uh, have to decide what they want. And that hasn't been easy at all. Yeah. That's why we have referendums and referendums that serve no purpose uh, and, and really do very little to uh, uh, advance a solution. Yeah, and I think that this, well, I've uh, been acutely aware of that situation for so many years that I followed it and uh, brought it up in the moot court competitions that we did several years ago. Um, it is difficult. We have, to, we have to bring this conversation outside of Puerto Rico because it's got, the solution has to be in Congress. And in Congress will not move so long as it's not an important issue to the particular congressman or senator um, that uh, he believes it becomes an American issue, not a little problem in the corner. So uh, that's why we're, we're trying to get together. That's why try, we're trying to, uh, uh, you know, enhance and, and push forward this conversation. So conversations like you and I are having can be had at home in, in Iowa and, and in Wyoming and the other places which ultimately have more say about Puerto Rico than Puerto Ricans themselves. So this is um, uh, our hope, and someday uh, when you get as big as the National Rifle Association or Christian Coalition and you have a convention of 5,000 people and you have the president's candidate, presidential candidates showing up at your convention, that is when you know that your, your, your block is of influence within the country. And that's ultimately, we start slow. You and I may not ever see that, but... but but hopefully someone else will pick up the batata, you know, and 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 baton is seguir por ahí. Hopefully that will happen. Manuel, um, thank you so much for giving us the time. I look forward to seeing you in September. I'll be going on to Puerto Rico uh, to, to to help with you guys. Hacer un baile, una salsero por ahí. Oh, yo soy salsero, okay. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and uh, I will enjoy it. Thank you so much for, for coming and joining us today. Thank you for the invitation. God bless.